Hi, and welcome to our screening of clips from Blood Sugar Rising. It's a documentary from PBS about the diabetes epidemic in America. Uh, we're going to watch some clips and have a panel discussion. And so joining us tonight, uh, we have Kim Mayberry from Cookville Regional Medical Center. Kim, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, yes, thank you, Misty. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for participating. But my name is Kim Mayberry. I've been a nurse for 25 years. I recently came to the Diabetes Center in 2016. Um, I'm a certified diabetes care and education specialist and also board certified in advanced diabetes management. Um, and I've enjoyed working here and I've learned a lot about it and I'm excited about talking about diabetes tonight. And as you all will well know, I'm going to show you my t-shirt. It is November is Diabetes Awareness Month, and we just had National Diabetes Day, so it's an awesome time to talk about it. Thank you. Yes, it is Diabetes Awareness Month, so it's a great month to be doing this. And then we also have joining us Laura Simpson, a dietitian. Laura, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. I'm Laura Simpson. I'm a registered dietitian and also a certified diabetes educator. And I've got 22 years experience in, um, in diabetes, but I'm also, I work at cardiac rehab, um, our cardiac rehab department at Cooper Regional. Thank you very much. And then we also have a couple of uh, patients from Cooper Regional joining us. We have Melissa. Melissa, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, hello, I'm Melissa Oliver. Might see it. <laughs> <laughs> you have, uh, were you diagnosed with type one or type two diabetes? I have two. I have two. Okay, thank you. And then we also have Tracy with us. Tracy, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes. Thank you for having me. My name is Tracy Petty, and I have been type 1 diabetic for 36 years. All right. Thank you very much. So the, the way the evening is going to progress is we're going to watch a series of clips from the, the documentary. The documentary itself is almost two full hours. So we're not gonna watch the full documentary tonight. You can access Blood Sugar Rising on your PBS Passport. Uh, and it is also going to air on uh, Monday the, I lost my date, Monday the 23rd at 8 p.m. on Channel 22. So you can watch the full documentary either on Passport or on Channel 22. Um, so what we're gonna see are actually a series of clips. We're gonna watch three clips to start. So you'll see three kind of slightly disconnected clips. And then we're going to pause for a moment and we're going to get thoughts and reflections from our panelists. And at any point during the, the clips, while the clips are playing or afterwards, if you have a question or a thought or a comment or a story you'd like to share, please feel free to put it in the Q&A or the chat and we'll be monitoring that and we'll ask the panelists and share that with them as well. So thank you very much once again for joining us tonight. And let's begin our screening of Blood Sugar Rising. When your child is diagnosed with diabetes as an infant, you have to do everything. Diabetes care is 24-7. It does not take the night off. <laughs> David is going to be one year old in a few days. <coughs> and two days ago, he was diagnosed with diabetes. Looked Daddy came sad about this. it. <laughs> Daddy came and got you. Hello, baby David. Daddy. Do you want some? He was about 11 months old, and my wife, Toby, is, uh, was a young pediatrician at the time, and uh, so she had a really keen eye for problems in children. One thing that had happened, which was quite scary, is I'd went to get him out of the car seat, and I, when I went to get him, he was just kind of staring, you know, uh, vacant, eyes open, but vacant. I mean, it's very alarming, very unusual behavior. So she brought him in to clinic, his blood sugar was 800, which is eight times the normal blood sugar level. She collected him, put him in the car, raced out the door and said, you know, David has diabetes and our lives have changed forever. And the task was upon us to manage his blood sugar levels. We really had two tools at our disposal. We had insulin and we had glucose, sugar, basically, um, carbohydrates, which is in foods like fruit, uh, juices, foods that would raise blood sugar carbohydrates um, we would use to keep his blood sugar from going too low. 
and then insulin was delivered to bring his blood sugar down. So these things are working to oppose one another. And the reason you need the carbohydrates is because you can very often overdose insulin just a little bit, but even a small amount of insulin can be lethal. We were injecting him with insulin with a needle probably seven times a day, and we were checking his blood sugar 15 times a day. That's how we started. When we checked his blood sugar, we used his fingers and his toes. So if he was playing with blocks in the middle of the room, I'd come up and I'd poke him in a toe. He had bruises up and down his arms for those first two months when we were giving him injections. And that was something that really was, was, was hard for us to see. <laughs> You're constantly in this tension between high blood sugar and low blood sugar because neither extreme is acceptable. There was so much work to be done, and so all of my faculties were focused on taking care of this little boy. I guess with my training, it was just too hard to think about that he would be compromised because I didn't do a good job. And with Ed's personality, that wasn't gonna happen. Ready? Ready? Come on, let's go get him. <laughs> the scariest prospect that we as parents face is this phenomenon called dead in bed syndrome. With people with type 1 diabetes, there's a small number of people who go to bed at night and they, and they don't wake up. This is his glucose level over the past um, roughly three hours. You can see the fact that he's going down means that if he weren't about to eat, he could go low. But fortunately, we're going to be feeding him with rice and things that will make him go higher. So I put the test strip in the meter. I draw up some blood. If it works, I just scoop up a little into the test strip. And 104. <laughs> I'm just gonna see how it's going in. All right, give it a stir. Here we go. All right, there you go. There's the carbohydrates. Thank you. So, David, we need to check uh, on the blood sugar situation. Oh, yeah, you wanna check yourself? We can take good care of David, day and night, 24 seven, seven days a week. But what happens when he goes to college? I wouldn't be there, my wife wouldn't be there to manage his blood sugars for him or to help him take care of his diabetes. And that overriding concern, worry, and fear that I had that really inspired, in my mind, the idea of building a bionic pancreas, a system that would basically take care of his diabetes for us, in our absence, automatically, better than we could and more safely than we could. I like that. The fact that Toby was a pediatrician, I was an engineer, that's really what started us down that path. The bionic pancreas really builds on the shoulders of really decades of technology development in medical devices. It comes from the synthesis of continuous glucose monitors, from insulin pumps, from smartphones. And it's the integration of those three technologies that makes a system which is really better than the sum of its parts. It's basically got automated decision-making software that determines how much drug to deliver to the person with type 1 diabetes every five minutes. It makes 288 decisions every day that you no longer have to make. Well, a dad's invention to save his diabetic son could change the lives of millions of people with diabetes. It is today's big idea. Ed Damiano developed the bionic pancreas. How confident are you that your dad can meet this goal and make this deadline to get you off to college safely? I don't doubt that he can do it. It's definitely very challenging, but if anyone could do it, my dad could. I think what we have to look forward to is that our device will play a meaningful role in keeping all those people with type 1 diabetes who use it safe and healthy until there's a biological cure. I come from a rough background. Back in those days, we ran out of food. We was eating syrup sandwiches, sugar sandwiches, where you just take the syrup and put it on the bread. And... 
drunk Hawaiian punch, Capri Suns, all that type of stuff. I'm a junk food addict. I eat candy, all type of sweets. It's been a real battle and a real struggle to where now I'm at this point. Monty Lee, at really the prime of his life, at the age of 36, almost 37, he's facing a really big challenge, uh, which is, is he gonna lose his foot? One of my cousins rushed me to the hospital and they checked my levels and they was looking at me like, how are you even standing here on your feet? You're supposed to be in a coma. Right. I thought I was about to die. That's what they told me that I had diabetes. And at that moment, my life changed. Mm -hmm. Can we look at your foot? Yeah. Would that be all right? Mm -hmm. I got an infection on the top of my toe. Just out of nowhere? Yeah. Yeah, I can see that. And But they said you might lose the toe. Yeah. OK, but I'm going to tell you, you don't want to put any weight on it. Yeah, I'm fighting it. Okay, my friend. Appreciate you. You too. Good Thank, luck. Thanks a lot. I used to think only old people got diabetes. So now waking up every day, having to check blood and make sure these levels are correct and all this different stuff. Trying my best here. Yeah, the more I do this, I'm getting better. I watched the doctors do this, so now I'm trying to be just as good as them. Wrapping it. Whew. Mission complete. Well, I'm at the house, doctor's orders to stay off my foot, so it's like a bed rest thing. It's been a challenge, but I'm maintaining, staying prayed up, and I've been getting blessed. Hi, son. Hi. How are you? Good. How was school today? Good. My son, his name is Montel, he's a junior. He has my whole name. His nickname is Lil Money, everybody calls him Lil Money. What's up, fella? What's up? Not much. Daddy just chilling. What's wrong? I was praying that you wouldn't have to get your toe cut off. Yeah, they did. The prayer came true. Yeah, see, that was good. Daddy glad you was able to pray for me, too, because I was scared. That's what my main worry is, is for you to do good in school. And play sports. And also take care of yourself. And to follow my dreams. Yep, and to take care of yourself because health is wealth, and Daddy don't want you to be sick like me with this disease that I got. So you gotta. I'm not eat. eating too much sugar. And you gotta eat your vegetables and drink milk and drink a lot of water so your body and your bones can be strong. My son, I love him to death. He's like my whole world. So I'm talking to him about not eating so much candy and the sweet stuff that could build up and might make you feel good now but affect your body later type stuff. So he's learning. I mean, it feel great to be back in the, in, the, in the studio, active, working on good music again. Got some good news from the doctor saying I'm healing right, everything's coming along. Here I am with Dr. Schillinger all excited, talking about, man, it looked like everything is closed up. I'm not 100%, but I'm getting close, so it's definitely a great feeling to be able to be back doing what I love. But I'm still out here on my grind, I'm going crazy. No way can I get left behind, I'm going crazy. I better hope he doesn't see you uh, see this video because he's you can stand up this whole time. Yeah, I know, man. I'm gonna get in trouble, but at least he can see I'm doing something positive and enjoying myself while I'm doing it. Look, here's the famous me? guy. Hey, How you doing, dog? Good to see you. You too. 
just to be frank with you, I love you, but we're, we didn't make any progress since the last visit. You didn't pick up your cholesterol medicine. Yeah, I know. You didn't change your insulin. I remember a lot of days I was just like ready to give up. Then I was I like, know you were. I can't give up. I had a talk with my son that kind of tripped me out too. Like, just to let me know that it's on his mind as well as mine. Mm -hmm. When I see that he's concerned, it just make me want to fight harder. Pretty much. Yeah. Marco, I'm one of the nurses here. I'm gonna help get you ready for your procedure, okay? And can you tell me in your words what procedure you're having done today? I'm about to cut my toe off. Remember, I'm Dr. An, and I'm gonna be your anesthesiologist okay. today. Um, so I know you've had multiple of these operations for that foot, all right? Hopefully this is one of the last ones, all right? It's gonna um, be the last one. Yeah. As of now, the way I feel, I feel great. I got my shoes on, I got the inserts in there, and y'all see me, I'm in the gym, trying to run around a little bit, and I'm, I'm, just, I'm just thankful that I was able to have a successful surgery and be able to move forward afterwards. My name is Nicole and I'm a type 1 diabetic. I think that um, no one prepares you for mentally what it's going to take to live with something that's so 24 7. Wonderful. I've had diabetes for 18 years and you always have to be thinking. You have to think before you exercise, what's your blood sugar? Before you go to sleep, what's your blood sugar? In the middle of the night, what's your blood sugar? When you're sick, what's your blood sugar? You know, it, it, it never escapes you. I was drinking a lot. It's like you're in a desert and you are, you're so thirsty, like you can't stop. From there, I was telling my mom, she was like, I think we need to get you tested for diabetes. And I was like, diabetes, what's that? I didn't know what it was. And she's just like, we need to take you to the doctor. Um, and she took me and right away they diagnosed me with diabetes and they started me on insulin within days. And I was terrified. I think it was deep rooted denial. I skipped insulin injections. I ate whatever I wanted. I pretended like I wasn't a diabetic. I now have a list of diabetes complications to include kidney disease, which turned into kidney failure, which turned into now I'm a dialysis patient. I have to go to dialysis three times a week and have my blood filtered out. If I don't do those things, I'll die. I think diabetes can be a very lonely disease. Social media connects me to other people that are like me. The more I was posting, the more messages I would get. The best way to deal with diabetes complications, prevent them to begin with. This stuff doesn't have an end date, it keeps going. This is why I desperately want a double transplant, kidney and pancreas. Even if I can help one person by sharing my story and showing them what this looks like, then, then it will be worth it. Because, like, I already know it's cut years off my life, so. I had just gotten back from, from Las Vegas. I go to dialysis, and I have a 310 number calling me. So I answered it, and it was a nurse, and she proceeded to tell me that, um, that they had found a match for me. Don't eat or drink anything. I'm happy and positive. I'm just nervous. 
that's like mostly what I'm feeling. And just to think that I'm not gonna be a diabetic anymore is crazy. Hi everybody. Hey, <laughs> I'm alive. <laughs> Some of you don't know that I had a kidney pancreas transplant about 11 days ago. I'm doing really great. The kidney is functioning at almost 100% and the pancreas is working great. So everyone has two kidneys and one pancreas. So now that I've had my dual transplant, I have three kidneys. So my two, the two that I had that failed, plus the new one, the donor uh, organs are right here. So the kidney and the pancreas. So you have a bunch in there. <laughs> They're hanging out. And then the pancreas is just doing its thing, and I could eat whatever I want. That's right, very good. So, thought about what you could do with all your spare time now? I don't know. That you don't have to be on dialysis? I, I don't know. I, I mean, I feel like I think I'm in shock a little bit. Yeah, it's pretty exciting. This is basically, at this point, the only cure for type 1 diabetes. And the cure is a pancreas transplant. So you're no longer are diabetic. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. And just so you guys know, I'm not going anywhere. I'm still going to be very connected to the diabetes community. Love you, Kayla. Bye, you guys. I don't have to count carbs. I don't have to get up like in the night and drink juice. I don't have to count 10 chips. You know, like I could, it's like you're free. So, um, some very powerful clips. We've had a, a comment from one of our panelists asking, um, can you share your feelings? I think this is more for Melissa and Tracy. Mm -hmm. Can you share your feelings about these clips and do they ring true yeah. for you? Tracy, you wanna comment on that first? Uh, yes, I have um, never had any of the major problems like the gentleman uh, Montiel did. Um, but I have wanted to know a little bit more about the um, pancreas transplant and if it would actually work in somebody like me that's been diabetic so long and still waiting on a cure. Hold up. And uh, Melissa, do you have anything to add to that? No, I had never had any dealings like that. So neither neither of you have ever had any of the, the significant complications that can come mm -hmm. from diabetes, like issues with, uh, like, I guess the infections getting, you know, some mm -hmm. tiny thing that becomes infected and doesn't go away or the, you know, well, that's, that's fortunate. Um, so uh, we have one of you, uh, Tracy, you're type one and Melissa, you said you're type two, correct? Yes. 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 Okay. So, uh, Kim, can you actually explain to us very quickly, what is the difference between type 1 and type 2 diabetes? Okay, yes. Um, and then there's something else I'd like to come back to on their comments. But um, basically, there's type 1 diabetes, type 2, and then gestational and pregnant women. However, even with type 1 and type 2, there are, there's a lot of heterogeneity, they call it, differences in individuals and their treatment. So in general, 90 to 95 percent of people that are adults have type 2 diabetes. Um, type 2 diabetes generally comes on a person around or after the age of 40, although in the last several decades it's been harder to tell the difference in some people because we can have obesity on top of type 1 diabetes, for example, and we do have type 2 diabetes occurring at younger ages, and we have some type 1 diabetes uh, called autoimmune diabetes occurring in people even as old as 70 or 80. But in general, type 1 diabetes means that the immune system has attacked the pancreas, the beta cells of the pancreas that are supposed to make insulin and those cells do not make insulin anymore and that person needs to take insulin from the outside whether it's with syringes or pins or a device such as an insulin pump like we saw in the first video 
with type 2 diabetes, generally it's adult, more adult onset, and the issue is usually what we call insulin resistance. The person still makes some insulin, at least in the beginning. Um, it may decrease over time, but that person generally can either just change their lifestyle early on, uh, eating healthy, exercising, managing stress, um, and then the first line drug in the treatment of type 2 diabetes is usually metformin. And we can add many other oral agents from there uh, up to then and including injections like you may have seen on TV, like Trulicity, Ozempic, um, that are a different hormone that help with sugar management um, and also help with weight loss. And up to and including insulin injections and even insulin pumps for type 2 diabetes. So um, those are the main differences, the autoimmune for type 1 versus insulin resistance more so in type 2. And the management is completely different, so we need to get the diagnosis correct in order to treat it appropriately. Another thing that I would like to say about the comment from the viewer about uh, how profound some of these videos were and the responses, um, the child and how overwhelming those feelings would be to feel so helpless and take care of your child, to realize that you've got complications and the burden that it places on a person to continually have to take care of and manage everything you eat, every activity you do, before I drive, before I sleep, that is a constant burden on either parents or the person with diabetes. Um, and there is a term, uh, we know that depression, for example, is 30% more common among people with diabetes than in the general population for one thing. Um, uh, the extreme of that is what we call diabetes distress. I am so overwhelmed and overburdened by the work of managing my diabetes uh, that I have given up. I am, uh, like you saw the gentleman in the second video, I'm down, I'm depressed. He said if it weren't for my son, I would have given up on this, uh, but because of him, I keep going. And I think those feelings of being overwhelmed are common and sometimes people stop taking care of themselves because it is so hard and so constant um so i don't know if tracy or melissa wants to comment on that but that's definitely uh, something that people struggle with on a daily basis or maybe even laura because laura has a lot of experience with diabetes you feel like there's never a easy way to take care of yourself it's totally a struggle every day to get the numbers you need to be able to get what about you, Melissa? Do you ever feel overwhelmed? Oh, yes. It's very stressful. Do you worry about complications or does that catch your mind? Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, Tracy had asked about the transplants uh, or mentioned it. And the thing I want to say about that is right now, um, if you need a kidney transplant, then a pancreas transplant is possible. If you have severe chronic pancreatitis, then a transplant might be possible. But generally, unless it's one of those two situations, it's not just something that's done just to cure diabetes. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So that's uh, a complication of diabetes that I guess they didn't really talk about. We didn't even really consider is the just the overwhelming emotional stress that can come from trying to manage such an illness. Um, and they did, and, and you mentioned Kim about, you know, controlling with health and, and with uh, or controlling your health with your diet and with exercise. Kim or uh, Laura, do you care to kind of comment about what does that mean when you talk about controlling diabetes with, with diet, what does that actually look like? Sure. And, Kind of to add with, with Kim, she talked a lot about the medicine part related to diabetes, but the diet and exercise are actually cornerstone management because there is so many different treatments for um, diabetes as far as sometimes we have pills, sometimes we have some injections that's not insulin, and then we also have insulin. But when you look at meal planning, 
Uh, the carbohydrates, and you'll hear us talk a lot about carbohydrates probably tonight. Carbohydrates are the foods that turn to sugar. And managing how much you have of those can make a difference in what the blood sugar is. Well, then you also have exercise that you add exercise in to help manage diabetes because exercise kind of like burns sugar. So you can actually time your exercise to maybe when the sugar tends to be higher. So maybe you have eaten a meal, your blood sugar has gone up, and then you exercise to help bring the blood sugar back down. So really there, there's such a balance between you know, the meal plan and the exercise along with medicines too. Meal planning wise, like I said, it's, it's carbohydrates. It's the main thing because they are the ones that turn to sugar. Some people count carbohydrates. Some people actually match the amount of insulin they take to the amount of carbohydrate they consume. And um, some people just need to eat healthier. And with weight loss, we see the blood sugars improving. Um, so, so really, it's a, it's a real balance to, to look at the, the food part and the exercise and the medicines all together. You mentioned, both of you actually mentioned weight loss, but um, in the video that we saw with Montiel, uh, we, we saw that actually he was very, like I would even say, you know, almost too thin, like painfully thin. But so I guess we, we tend to have an image in our mind when we think of someone who's diabetic, but it's not always the case, is it? I mean, it, how much does your, your weight actually play into your likelihood to get diabetes? Is it a major factor? Is it just one of many factors? With type two diabetes, it's gonna be a major factor because just a weight loss of five to 10% can actually normalize blood sugars. If you have pre-diabetes, um, you can actually keep from getting diabetes looking through weight loss. So weight is a huge thing, but that's someone with type two diabetes. And the, the guy that was in the video very likely had type one diabetes. And I know Kim mentioned this too, sometimes you can't always tell based on weight, but, but my thought, he probably has type one diabetes. And um, so he would be on insulin you know, watching his foods, which he had difficulty watching his foods. He ate a lot of, a lot of sugar, which we'll talk about some too, but, um, you know, and, and obviously he was unable to exercise at first until he had his, his amputation, but um, you're really looking at that, that balance and weight loss does make a difference in type two diabetes. So we have a question from our viewers. Um, I'll ask you individually, Tracy, um, how long have you had, uh, if you don't mind sharing with us, when were you diagnosed with diabetes? I was diagnosed a year ago. I'm sorry, can you say that one more time? I was diagnosed 36 years ago with type one. Okay, so you've had diabetes since you were very young. Yes. Okay, and then Melissa, um, how long have you been living with diabetes? Uh, since 2005. Since 2005. So, um, Tracy, what would you say has been the most difficult aspect of this for you? Like we saw with uh, one of the, the people in the video, she got diagnosed, but she didn't want to accept it because it happened to her kind of at a difficult age. She was in her early 20s. And so for her, it was hard to accept that she had to change her lifestyle drastically. Was it easier for you because you were diagnosed so much younger or... Like what, what would you say has been the most difficult part for you in, in dealing with diabetes and managing it? Um, part of it would be not wanting to be singled out and being different from the other kids. I was so young that I didn't really know what was going on. I, I was started on one shot a day and then I went um, up to four before I got my insulin pump many years later, but I didn't realize that not taking that first shot the first thing of the morning, what it could do until I got older and realized the complications. I decided it was time to try to start taking care of myself. And I still have problems about it daily, but things that we're working through, so. Uh, and Melissa, what would you say has been the hardest part for you? Like, what's the thing that you struggle with the most? Um changing my whole lifestyle it's been rough so what kind of if you, if you don't mind sharing with us what kind of changes have you had to make uh, my eating habits and just everything exercising 
So we kind of also saw from the video, uh, we saw it more with, with David because he was a child, of course, um, but the impact that it has on the whole family and how the whole family ends up kind of becoming part of this process. So um, I guess it's kind of a multi-part question. Um, Kim, do you think that, like what kind of role, well, and, and Laura too, what kind of role does family play in helping someone to maintain and to, to control their diabetes? Right, and I will definitely answer, but I can tell you that Laura knows the answer to this from experience. Um, the family and the support of either family or friends um, is extremely important since it is all aspects of a person's life. Especially as people get older, but at all ages, of course, a baby is dependent on the parents. And then um, sometimes older people that can't manage their meals, can't remember things as easily anymore, maybe don't have the dexterity to give the injection, can't maybe use a pump like they once did. Um, so no matter who you are, at what age, Having support, someone who can help you remember, someone who can support you when you're down, someone who knows your regimen, someone who knows how to treat you when you're having an emergency um, are extremely important. A person cannot really be managed by themselves completely. They need that support and help. And Laura, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Really, I just echo the same thing. Support can really, really make a difference. Um, you know, I think the first clip when it showed the the mom and the dad with, with the, the, the little boy, um, wow, he had great support. He had, you know, so much, um, you know, a pediatrician for a mom, an engineer for a dad, you know, wanting to come up with the, the bionic pancreas. and. You know, I think that really, you know, showed, and I think that as he grew up, he was more successful because he did have so much support, and it also seemed like the parents were almost afraid to let go, <laughs> you know, because they knew they were helping him when he was at home, and they were really concerned when he went off to college, you know, what was going to happen, um, so you could really see the, the support there. I think with the second clip, he didn't quite have as much support, but he had his son that he, well, he did have support, but it was more like he had something to focus on. I want to try to be better because of my son, you know, and you could, you could really see that. Um, the third clip, I think the mom was present um, at some point in that, that clip. I think she went to the doctor's office with her, went to the hospital with her. Um, she seemed like she was a little more on her own, but I think she did have a circle of friends that were there that could also support her. And I, I think just to echo a lot what Kim said, support's real important. And I would wonder, you know, Tracy and Melissa, have you had support, you know, in your journey with diabetes too? And yes, yes. yes. Good, good. Melissa, what kind of what kind of support do you get from your family if you don't mind sharing? Um, my husband's very supportive, and then I've got two girls that's supportive. And then there's a lot of times I'll take skin. <laughs> and then, uh, Tracy, what kind of uh, support network do you rely on? Um, I rely on my husband, and like the gentleman, he relied on taking care of himself to be there for his kids. And I've taught my kids about the importance of, okay, if mama's got glazy eyes or something, check her sugar, check her pump and see what it's telling you as far as the numbers and treat, treat from there. So they're pretty well up to date on what we need to do if I'm high or low, if, if I can't take care of myself. That's fantastic. So you actually mentioned having a pump and that was something that they talked about. Uh, the bionic pancreas, is that essentially what they're talking about, the, the insulin pump? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So is that, how would you say that has changed? So could, because you, you have had diabetes since you were a kid. How would you say that's changed your getting the insulin pump has changed having diabetes and, and managing your diabetes? Well, like I said, I still have problems just about daily, but, um, up until I found Miss Kim back in April or May of this year, I was struggling every day. I, what I thought was feeling good, 
my shirt, my shirt was running 250, 280. Um, the first couple of days that we had my numbers down after visiting with Miss Kim, um, my sugars was running like 160, 165, and I didn't know how to feel. I felt bad because I was not used to it being, that's still high, but I wasn't used to it being actually that good. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, and so another question that had come from our uh, viewers, how has diabetes affected your your basically your life outside family like your career path so uh, melissa did you want to share an answer to that or tracy I, it's kind of hard because you have to take time and check your sugars and do all that yeah. during your working hours tracy did you have anything you wanted to add to uh that? yes my my job is very supportive of it um i've been with the company 20 years and they know that if I have a problem to go ahead and take care of myself right then. Okay. So in addition to checking your sugar, I imagine you're, you're probably not like other people. You know, some of us, we forget to take our lunch to work and you know, we just go grab any old horrible thing from a fast food restaurant, but you guys probably don't necessarily have that option. Is that true? Or can you, you know, is it one of those things where some days you can go kind of get what you need or other times you have to really be careful at what you choose or do you just always have to remember to pack your lunch? Yeah, I eat at work because I work in a cafeteria. So, and then I'll choose kind of what we have. Okay. Yes, I'm on the same path of eating at work most of the time. Oh, okay. So you're both a little fortunate that you have choices at work that you can, that you can have that, that kind of help you control. Okay. Yes. All right. Um, did anyone have anything else that they wanted to add about, like, it, we, we watched, you know, we learned a little bit about the, the insulin pump, and we saw, you know, a gentleman who, you know, even though he didn't fit that, what you consider to be that image of someone with diabetes, you know, still had a diabetic, and we, oh, sorry, we did have a question. Um, so, can diabetes patients attend the Cookville Regional Cardiac Rehab Facility? I am wondering, okay, so two questions. First is that one, can diabetes patients attend the Cookville Regional Medical Center Rehab, Cardiac Rehab Facility? They have to have some kind of event before they can actually enter the program. So let's say they're hospitalized and had a stent or had a heart attack. There's things that actually will trigger for them to be able to come to cardiac rehab. When, when they're cardiac rehab, they have something called phase one, and phase one is when a nurse actually meets the patient in the hospital and then enters them into the cardiac rehab program. So, but at that point is when they determine, are they eligible to come? There has to be certain criteria for them to be able to come to rehab. Okay. And then a uh, second question is, uh, so what do you do for exercise? now in specifically in the COVID environment? And that would be for Tracy and Melissa. Like it, what do you do to, to get that exercise that you need to help maintain right now when you can't necessarily go out in public and do the things that you would normally do? Now we usually walk around the neighborhood. Okay. Yes, that, that's what we do too. I live far away from just about everybody. <laughs> Well, I think we, we are actually a little bit lucky that way. In some ways, we're lucky that way that we live in a more rural area. And so some of the things that might impact people in a city in relation to COVID or something like that don't necessarily impact us because, you know, we can go walk in the neighborhood or go walk down the road or go to the park a little more easily. We don't have as many people to worry about here. Um, but yeah, did anyone have anything that they would like to add before we move on to the next set of clips? Yes, I'd like to add just a little bit more about finding support for people um, and some things that are out there and available. And we will email this out so that people can have this. But at diabetes.org, there is the diabetes online community. So that's definitely a resource. Also, there are hundreds of what we call uh, recognized diabetes education programs throughout the United States. So no matter where people live, usually in their area, um, 
there are diabetes education centers or diabetes education specialists that are associated with endocrinology offices or primary care offices that can provide that education and support uh, for people. Um, also, there are for children and parents, of course, the children's hospitals and the educators specifically for them, but there are diabetes camps throughout the United States that they can attend to be with other children who have diabetes while at the same time learning how to manage their diabetes and play, make choices, and learn to be a little more independent with that. So there are a lot of resources out there that are available we will try to make some of those available to you so we can share with the audience uh, but I also encourage if you don't have a support person or support people to join um, even on social media um, groups just so that you can connect with other people who are dealing with the same types of things um, so that you have other people to talk to to bounce problems off of to get encouragement when you're down and to find that support. Now, if you're looking for good clinical information, diabetes.org, like I said, or look at, there's also the standards of care online, the medical standards of care for diabetes that are available at diabetes.org. Um, also the American Association of Diabetes Education Specialists and uh, the American College of Clinical Endocrinology uh, are other resources for support that people can go to. At crnchealth.org, that's the Cookville Regional website. We have our information. Also, we have an app that we created in conjunction with Tennessee Tech called Diabetes in Your Body. So that's an app you can either get on your smartphone uh, through Google Play or the iPhone store. And it teaches people about potential complications related to diabetes and also connects you with NIH.org, the National Institutes of Health, and CDC and other websites such as the ADA in, to find out information about diabetes prevention and preventing complications. Wonderful, and we are actually going to be uh, emailing the information that's being shared with us to the participants following the events, so keep an eye on your email for that because we will be sending out these websites and the links and some additional information. Okay, so uh, let's go ahead and we're gonna proceed with the, the next set of clips from Blood Sugar Rising. Here in our little neck of the woods, you can just look around and see that we show love to each other in our area with food. That's what we do. We get together, churches, baby showers, bridal showers, birthdays. We're always eating. When you come to our homes, we say, come on in, let me fix you something to eat. It's how we were raised. We don't get together unless there's food. And usually it's not really good choices. I'm Laura Greaser, and I'm the community health worker, the lead at the Meigs County Health Department. I was diagnosed as being pre-diabetic in 2012. I didn't understand really what the big deal was. It wasn't until I started doing all the research and I thought, why shouldn't I use this knowledge that I've got? I can't teach somebody else to live a healthier life and come home and eat a bag of potato chips. That's not right. I can't do that. One of the big things in Mix County is the pride of the people here and the independence. It's very, very hard for proud people to say, I can't do this, I need some help. And so I tell them, please just give me three months, give me three months out of your life and listen to what I'm saying and get with this program. If it doesn't work and you don't see any changes in three months, I'll leave you alone and you can go on. No one has ever done that. Every time I do an intake, I always ask them, what do you think caused your diabetes? 
And it doesn't matter what their weight is or what their eating program is, it is always because my dad had it or my mom had it or my aunt had it, my sister or my brother. So everyone feels as though I might as well just give it up because dad had it and he died from it. So when they're given that diagnosis, it's a very sad thing to witness. In pop. So now knowledge is power. So now you can tell all your family this too. So in one 20 ounce bottle of Mountain Dew, there are more than 18 teaspoons of sugar. That's what it looks like. When you're drinking a bottle of Mountain Dew, you're drinking that much sugar. Mm -hmm. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. And all pop is about the same. Carbs in one cup of pineapple. 22 grams of total carbohydrate in one cup chunks. Okay. Carbs in bananas. One of the things that we do in our diabetes education is we show patients how to read food labels. So one serving size is half a cup. And there are four grams of carbohydrates in half a cup. So that's a good choice. That gives them power over what they're eating when they can make the choice. Do I put it in the cart or do I put it back on the shelf? Here's one of the best things that you can eat, the plums. Okay, that's because nice one plum one. only has eight grams of carbohydrates in the whole thing. I found out how much I didn't know about diabetes. I didn't understand about counting the carbs. Watch your sweets, watch the sugar intake, your fried foods, that all affects your diet. Of those three types, which one's the best? This one. There you go. We're learning, I should say, to eat differently. They soak all of these fruits in sugar. Oh my goodness, I can't even believe that you picked that up. That is evil. We don't even want to talk about them. Now. One of my biggest pet peeves is with our labeling in the United States. If it says sugar free, my patients pull that off of the shelf, put it in their cart, and think, I can have eight or 12 of these cookies because they're sugar free. They're not sugar free. It's, it's not true. A serving size is four cookies. And in four, those four cookies, there are 21 grams of carbohydrates. And it does have the sugar alcohol. It has sorbitol in it. They're sugar-free in huge letters. The game is rigged. Our labeling is done in such a way that it's almost a lose-lose situation. Because people think that they're doing so well, but they're really not. gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker this afternoon, uh, Dr. Valerie Bluebird Jernigan. She's a member citizen of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. So please join me in welcoming her, Dr. Jernigan. I'm Valerie Jernigan, and I'm an intervention scientist. So the interventions that I do are focused on improving the food environments of tribal communities and thereby improve diabetes. Diabetes is a story that's about access to food. It's a story that's about opportunities and a story that's about getting out of poverty and reducing all the risk factors that combine to create that storm of diabetes. You don't really have to look very far to see the relationship between cultural genocide and diabetes. The boarding schools took Native children away from their families. And in my grandma's case, they took her, cut her hair, reprimanded her for speaking Choctaw. They were intended to take Native people and to erase the native 
whiteness from them and to make them white. The trauma that occurs as a result of that is well documented in terms of producing all kinds of negative health outcomes. Diabetes is the tip of the iceberg. Growing up, I did not have access to healthy foods. I was a kid who grew up eating what's called commodity foods. Commodity foods look different than other foods. It's just surplus foods. So some months we would have a lot of canned milk. We would have mashed potato flakes. So nothing is fresh, everything is packaged. So back in the 1980s, the commodity program was a way to fill your family's tummies. And that's pretty much how a lot of people did it not by choice, but rather out of necessity. If you didn't have enough dollars to make it through the month, you had to participate in that program just in order to get through the month. At the time we were eating the commodity foods, we really had no idea that they were going to impact health. There was no sense at all that this is going to hurt us. My dad has type 2 diabetes, and he's had type 2 diabetes for 20 years. Just give me a couple eggs scrambled with some sausage patties and hash browns. Scrambled with sausage and hash browns? Mm hmm Remember our aunt passed away because of diabetes. Of course, she lived a long, happy life, but still the diabetes, you know, she went blind yeah. because of diabetes. And that's what worries me, is that sometimes I feel great and sometimes I don't. And, uh, and I'm sure it's all because, and my heart attack was because of diabetes. Half the Indians in Oklahoma are getting commodities. And if you look at the commodities, it's all so much carbohydrates, it's got a, it's got a affect your diabetes. So this would be what a typical convenience store would look like. In this town, at least, one of the only places that you can actually shop for food. And our own research shows that people eat here multiple times a week for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. It's not healthy. I mean, if you can just think about it for a minute, eating the majority of your foods from a gas station, then you can kind of imagine how you might start to feel after doing that for long periods of time. How close is the closest grocery store here? Do you know? Uh, <laughs> To see a salad on a menu seems like a small thing, but it's actually, it's actually a pretty big deal. And I think it's a step in the direction toward changing social norms. We objectively improved the overall quality of these stores, which was something really important to us because we could take that back to leadership and show them that not only did you not lose any revenue, but in some months you actually gained revenue and your stores got objectively healthier. We can't think about diabetes without taking that broader approach. That's what I want to see in my lifetime. That's what I hope I can see in, in my work. How food tastes good, but it may not be good for you. Um, and so the question is, how can we alter some of those recipes to make the, the, the recipes that we love, that we've grown up with, to make them better for us? And I think that's a, a Laura question. Um, I actually like to do that a lot, take the recipes I always use and modify them. Most of the time when you're modifying, it tends to be modifying the fat content more than 
other things, it just depends on what you serve along with it. Um, for example, if you have a casserole and it calls for um, sour cream, you can use a light sour cream. You can use a fat-free sour cream. You could use instead like a plain yogurt. So there's different things that you swap out for that particular ingredient being the sour cream. Um, like let's say you've got a casserole that calls for two cups of cheese. Well, you can easily back it down to one cup of cheese. It tastes just fine. I just say it's not oozing and goozing <laughs> like we're used to having it. Um, but it still has the flavor there. So we can modify things to reduce calories, to reduce fat, and that can be helpful, you know, when you're looking at the weight loss for someone with diabetes. I really thought um, that there was a lot of meat in that particular, um, those two segments. Um, did I answer the question enough for the, the panelists so I can I think so. go on so, if I need to say anything more? So what you're saying is kind of look at what your ingredients are. Can you reduce some things and, and make them less? Can you choose a light version or a fat-free version to make it a little healthier? Yeah. Um, like a lot of recipes around here especially may call for quite a lot of butter. Right. At least our family recipes seem to call for an awful lot of butter. What would you recommend to, to make that? Like, how could you how could you alter that to make that healthier? Sure. It depends on what you're serving. If you're just sauteing, you can easily switch to oil, or you can use just a like nonstick cooking spray. You don't really have to have you know all that butter. Some people that just feel like I just have to have that butter flavor. I'll tell them to maybe do half and half or do a type of um, margarine that has more of a better flavor. Like I can't believe it's not butter, has more of a better type flavor. So there, there's things that you can, you can alter. Another thing you can do is increase the vegetables. Say it's a particular um, casserole. We'll just add more vegetables than what it calls for. Then the quarter, one of the quarters you put the meat and one of the quarters you put the starch because we were talking about carbohydrates earlier, the carbohydrates come in the form of starch, fruit, and milk. So when you're looking at a plate, the starch is the one that affects the blood sugar the most. That's the main source of carbohydrates. So if you make it the smaller part of the plate, it can have a lesser effect on your blood sugar because the, the protein part, the meat, and the vegetables, and we're talking about non-starchy vegetables like green beans and broccoli and carrots that don't have as much effect on the blood sugar. So that's a, a, a way to look at meal planning to help, you know, cut back the carbohydrate, but you still have a full plate of food. So that's, that's one meal plan approach I, I do. Um, I think it's very helpful to use when you're looking at planning. Okay, that's, that is helpful. And that seems pretty easy for anybody to do as well. Um, I think another thing probably with food in our region, not even necessarily just in our region, let's not give ourselves too hard of a time. I think this is pretty common everywhere is the sauces that we use or the dressings that we like to put on things. Um, I noticed in one of the videos, you know, like you said, there was a lot of meat, but, and you know, protein in and of itself is probably not a bad thing, but I guess maybe when it's interested in maybe a sugar laden barbecue sauce, or, you know, a salad is a wonderful thing, but not if you cover it in ranch dressing. Right. So, you know, is that, that's another area maybe where people can look at what they're putting on their food, not just what they're eating, but what we're putting on our foods as well. Sure. Like, are there other examples of that that you can think of? I like to teach what I call fork method, which means when you're looking at the dressing, you put dressing on the side, like putting a little little cup on the side of your salad. You stick the fork tines in the dressing, and then you pierce the lettuce, and then you take a bite. Well, if you do that, every time you stick the fork tines in the dressing, pierce the lettuce, take a bite, you taste the dressing, and you won't use as much. I've actually been to a restaurant several years ago, and the waiter actually asked me, do you not like your dressing? <laughs> because it looked like I didn't use any. He couldn't even tell that I had used it. So mm -hmm. it really makes a difference in every bite you taste. And I just find that very you know, helpful because the dressing is where a whole lot of calories are, a whole lot of fat. 
and depending on the kind of there's also carbohydrates in there too. So that's a way to get by with still having your dressing because you want that flavor, but you don't have to use as much. Yeah. Right. And, and so uh, something that I had personally found, because I used to be really guilty about the, I loved ranch dressing and I, I just would eat way too much of it on a salad. And then the salad was just, there was no point anymore at that point. Um, I, at some point, a friend convinced me to switch over to using a, like a light olive oil, like an extra virgin olive oil to find one that actually I enjoyed the flavor of and to use like just a drizzling of olive oil with just a little bit of salt and pepper to kind of flavor it. And I actually really enjoyed that. Is that a better alternative? I mean, to me, it seemed healthier, but what may seem healthier may not be healthier. Is that actually a, a healthy alternative for something like that? It would be, and actually you can take um, oil and vinegar together, and that's probably one of the best salad dressings you can use. Um, there's still more calories in it because it is, you know, there's still the oil there. Okay. And it, it's sometimes harder to manage how much you use when you use the vinegar oil because it's so thin. Um, so, but that's, that's the best dressing to use. But then if you're looking at um, trying to reduce how much dressing you use, that's where the fork method might work work better. When you have a thicker type of salad dressing that sticks on the fork times a little bit better. So um, it is, so before we go on to, to any of the other questions, was there anything kind of watching that where they talked about, they, they, they brought up a lot of interesting points in that, not just about sugar and carbs, but also about the types of foods that are prevalent, especially in certain areas. So is there anything before we kind of get a little further into questions that any of you would like to comment about on any of that? I'd like to make um, one more comment about looking at the food label and talking about the carbohydrates. Um, I know they talked about sugar free products and um, you know just trying to look at labels, but carbohydrate is like the 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 big title and when you look at a food label after you've looked at the nutrition facts where it says the serving size at the top and you go down more toward the bottom and it says total carbohydrate the carbohydrate includes everything that's going to turn to sugar so even if something says sugar free you still always want to look at the carbohydrate content because that is what's turning to sugar. And I think that gets confusing when people see something sugar-free and that's what the lady was saying. It's not sugar-free, it still has carbohydrates. So it's not carbohydrate-free. So when you're looking at labels, you still wanna look at that part too. And, and when you look at the carbohydrate, it's a dark, it's a bolder print. And then everything underneath it is a lighter print and it's also indented. So you can see that those are the things that are included in the total carbohydrate, you know, part. So that can be helpful looking at labels that it's the carbohydrate, not necessarily the, the sugars that are the problem. So actually a question about that then you're, you're talking about when you look at the label, like it'll say, you know, carbohydrates in bold. And then you said, like you said, everything underneath it is indented and then included under that is always sugars. So does yes. that mean like these are the sugars you're going to get once these carbohydrates uh, convert to sugar or is this the sugar in addition to the carbohydrates? Right. It's actually included a carbohydrate, but it could, it's, it could be added sugars or it could be sugars okay. that are already present. In food. So if you look at, let's say, a can of fruit and you have the carbohydrate and, and yours is as high as the carbohydrate number, yeah. that's because fruit is turns to sugar it's all sugar um doesn't make fruit bad um but when you look at the sugars it could be naturally occurring or or you know added to the food so okay um so a lot of our questions about from this segment are for laura um, <laughs> so are there there, there, there kind of was a, a thing a few years ago about, you know, kind of a campaign against corn syrup and corn syrup solids and corn sugars and processed sugar. So is there actually a difference in how and what 
a processed sugar like a corn syrup uh, does to your body versus a natural sugar like a fruit sugar? Like, do those have different effects on your body in general and when it comes to diabetes? I was saying in general, any kind of sugar, whether it be honey, you know, table sugar, molasses, brown sugar, all those things do turn to sugar. Um, the thing is, when you have fruit and you have the sugar from fruit, you also have other things along with it. You've got vitamins and minerals and fiber. So, you know, for example, when you talk about processed versus a whole type of food, you're better off when you have diabetes or for weight loss or, or just health in general, take the whole piece of fruit instead of the juice. Because the whole piece of fruit, we have to chew it, get it stuck in our teeth. And, you know, we've got the vitamins and minerals and the fiber that we don't have when we have juice. Juice is good if you're treating low sugar. You know, if your blood sugar's low, you know, juice is something we want to, to have because it gets into the bloodstream more quickly. If you have a low sugar, that's what we want to do. But if it's something like, um, if you're having it for a snack or having some kind of fruit, it's better to have the whole piece of fruit if you can. Okay. Um, and then, so one of the things they talked about, uh, they, they, they discussed the, maybe the types of foods like fast food and convenience store food, which is mostly convenience store foods, pretty much all deep fried. Yeah. So is the method of food preparation also, we, we know the quality. I mean, I think we, we can kind of all understand maybe the quality of food in general makes a difference, but is also the method of preparation like that, that deep frying, even if it's in an oil that maybe isn't necessarily high in fat, like, is that still, going to have a negative effect on, you know, somebody what, when we're talking about pre-diabetes or the risk of diabetes and then also on diabetes management. Mm -hmm. And the meat, you know, it's always better to bake, broil, grill, you know, always better to do those things instead of frying. When you're looking at frying, not only are you adding the oil, but you're also, you're usually breading it too. Mm -hmm. So you've added not just fat, but you've added more carbohydrate in addition to that. Um, and you know, some people are using it. Broiling to me is, is better because it gives you the crisp edge that people are looking for. Or I know that air fryers, you know, the last few years have been more popular. Those give you a good crisp outside texture to the meats that make you think that they're fried even though it require very little oil, you know, so, so the method of preparation, you know, does, does make a difference. Um, okay. So I'm going to ask uh, Melissa and Tracy now um, and uh, kind of a question about food. What was, so uh, Melissa, we'll start with you. Um, and you're going to, you're going to see a, a request to unmute yourself, but what was, when it came to your diet, what would you say was the hardest thing to change? And what, what is the, like kind of your favorite go-to healthier food that you found? Uh, probably like brown and stuff like that hard. That was very hard. And then I started doing like bacon okay. stuff more. Is there a particular like meal that you, you like to prepare, like a baked meal that you like to prepare? Or do you just, it, does that just kind of your go-to? If I need to make something, I'll just bake it. It makes it healthier. Yeah, that's what I do normally. Um, and then Tracy, so same questions. What did you, what was the, the food that you considered maybe the hardest to give up? or that you found the hardest to kind of adjust with? What, did you, what was your healthier alternative that's kind of your go-to? And you should also be seeing a little request to unmute yourself. I could eat, eat the spaghetti and the sauce, but that was the tomato sauce. That's what would run my show. Okay. Oh, we lost Tracy. Okay, you can come over here. I'm sorry, her battery just died, but she's coming over here to my screen, okay? Okay, thank you. I'm so sorry. No worries. Technical difficulties happen. Um, 
um, I learned that, like I said, I eaten spaghetti, that the sauces and the noodles was what really got me. Um, I had a cousin who is also married to a diabetic, which is type two, and they recommended me to try the spaghetti squash. And that makes a big difference. I don't like the sauce that much anyways. Okay. So, and it's quicker to fix. <laughs> oh, and so you're using the squash instead of the noodles and it's yes. a healthier alternative. It's crispier, but it's, it's good. Hmm. I like that. Okay. So uh, does anybody have anything they'd like to add before we go to our, we're, we're actually running a little bit out of time. So we're going to do just one more clip. So does anybody have anything they'd like to add before we go to that last clip? I just wanted to mention something talked about the spaghetti squash um, if somebody was actually doing you know just the regular spaghetti you can do a whole grain spaghetti and see that that may do a little bit better on someone's blood sugar um, or do like a brown rice or some whole grain spaghetti oh, something. Uh -oh. <laughs> oh no you're you're there sorry no, you're good. You're good. So a whole grain, whole grain. Uh, pasta could actually be a good substitute. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, wonderful. All right, so we're going to go ahead and start our last clip again. We're going to, we were going to do three more clips, but we're running a little short on time. So we're just going to do this one kind of last clip and then we'll come back and, and do our final discussion and closing. Yeah. yeah, so Alec, just before he was turning 24, was feeling like he was getting sick. They diagnosed him on the spot with type 1 diabetes. I remember him crying um, initially. Like he, he was really strong, but then he kind of broke down and he realized, you know, being a diabetic, he had to completely change. You know, with him being 24, an active young man, I thought, oh, how is he ever going to manage this? He's going to have to change his lifestyle. He's going to have to change, you know, basically everything, his eating habits. But he he did well. He adjusted really well. I was surprised. Walk in the house, and this is my crib. He was going to have a steady income. He was going to be able to afford you know, living on his own. Alec was an amazing person. He was a jokester. He was always pulling pranks on somebody or doing something goofy to make you laugh or smile. I think Alec was very determined to do right by my parents and show them that they've raised a, a young man, a hardworking man that could take care of himself. He turned 26, so he was no longer eligible to be under my, my insurance policy. When he went to the pharmacy the first time to pick up his insulin, without my coverage, his bill was 1300 He didn't have 1300 in the bank, so he left the pharmacy without his insulin and started rationing what little bit of insulin he had left, hoping to stretch it out to payday. He didn't tell any of us that he was doing this. I think he was enjoying his, his freedom of living on his own for the first time. So I, I, I think that's why he didn't ask for help. I don't think he knew that not taking the required amount of insulin would lead to death. It was absolutely horrifying. I just miss my son. I think we'd all would do anything to get, get our son back, our brother back. That week and after that moment, I mean, it changed us all forever. It still really sometimes doesn't feel real feels like maybe Alec is just on vacation. And then there's moments where I wake up and I'm like, my, my son is gone. 
I'm not going to see him anymore. So this is the memorial garden that we created in honor of Alec. And we will keep fighting in his honor and his memory. People hadn't really been talking about it. Type 1 diabetics not being able to afford their insulin. They've been keeping it kind of private. Yep. I was shocked to hear all the people that had reached out to me through social media saying, hey, my brother died the same way, or my son died the same way, my friend died the same way and I knew that it was an issue that needed to be addressed. Alex's story has been shared all over the world. This story is generating quite a conversation on the 11 Alive Facebook page right now. Alex's story has been reaching more than 200,000 people on Facebook with hundreds of comments, and the common themes we're seeing, outrage, and people wanting something done about this. I don't want what happened to Alec Smith to happen to my son. My son Alec Smith was one of those diabetics who died because he did not have enough insulin. He died because he could not afford to live. His insulin was too expensive. Alec's body was found three days prior to payday. Rationing is not uncommon among the diabetic community. Diabetics are starving themselves, working two and three jobs, cashing in on their retirements, dropping out of college, filing bankruptcy, maxing out credit cards, buying expired insulin from the black market. We will not go away. We will not stop sharing our stories. We will not stop. Medications that keep somebody alive, especially, should be made readily available and at a very, very low cost. We shouldn't be fighting for our lives. So that was, was probably a pretty um, intense and uh, not very happy clip to end on, but I'm kind of glad we ended on that one because to me, watching the documentary uh, in full, which I have, um, that to me was one of the most impactful parts of, of the Blood Sugar Rising documentary and something that flabbergasted me, this concept that diabetes without insurance, and, and I, I can imagine that in some instances it could be even more, but $1,300, for what's probably a one month supply of diabetes is just the fact that they charge something like that. And then it goes into more detail about this whole, about how the whole thing happened with the drug companies and how they, they there were hearings to kind of hold the drug companies responsible and they pushed the blame off onto somebody else when ultimately it came back to them. But uh, so I, my question then to the panelists is, is that something that, I guess this may be this question might be a little more for Kim from your experience working with multiple patients, but maybe also for, for uh, Melissa and um, Tracy, what has been your experience? Is, is it the same in our region where is the, the cost of insulin without insurance? Does it make it prohibitively expensive if you don't have insurance? So in the past, it's definitely been very difficult, and I would say that we've had people probably die here in our area, even from lack of insulin or insulin being unaffordable, rationing like you saw. In recent years, um, it has come to the attention of our government, of large drug companies, of insurance companies, and of 
physicians, nurses, and other groups that try to advocate for people with diabetes. And so in this process, what we have seen recently is that some some of those insulins are lower, about one third the cost of previous. Also, um, I find that sometimes there is a little bit of lack of knowledge about um, support and help that is also out there in the community um, that people may not be aware of. So, um, for instance, local health departments uh, will see people for their diabetes. They do have primary care physicians and nurse practitioners, and they do, um, if the income guidelines, uh, you know, are met, they do provide insulin to people that are uninsured or that don't have um, enough income to buy the insulin. Um, also, there are programs such as the low income subsidy program offered through the Social Security Administration, which is a program that Medicare recipients can get on that is separate and apart from their Medicare benefit. It is strictly for drug coverage. And it uh, has specific income and asset guidelines as well. But if you meet those guidelines, your insulin would be completely covered. If you met another little bit higher level, it would be a lower price for you. That program would assist you with that. And then also other programs that people may not be aware of are through the drug companies themselves. So Lilly Cares, Merck Health, uh, Sanofi, some of the other drug manufacturing companies, they all have patient assistance programs. So you can either go online to their website or if you don't have that type of access, you can call the 1-800 number on your package insert or your box of your insulin. So the maker of your insulin oftentimes has a patient assistance program and their income guidelines are higher than, for example, the low income subsidy program income guidelines. So there's a lot of assistance out there. Um, no doubt the prices needed to be lowered and that has slowly it is slowly starting to come about. But in the meantime, what do you do? How do you get your medication? Um, you try to go through these avenues. You go to your primary care physician's office or your endocrinologist's office. You ask for samples, free samples. It won't, it won't get you through forever, but it can bridge you through during an emergency. Um, and those are, so those are some of the resources that are out there. Um, and I was happy to see that in recent months, those generic insulins have come out and they are much more affordable, but there is still work to be done. That's very good information. I was actually going to ask you what resources we had available. So you, you answered the very next question. Um, and if you will actually share with me those same things that, that you just mentioned, uh, we'll, we'll put that together for the email that we're going to send out to our participants afterwards. Um, and we'll we'll talk through that and make sure we get all of those resources together in that email. Because to me, I think that is maybe one of the, the, the more immediately necessary resources is to know that if, if you are already taking insulin and you're having difficulty paying for it, or if you know, you're struggling with keeping insurance coverage, that there are resources that you don't have to go without your insulin and then you don't have to ration. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's wonderful. Thank you. So we've reached the end of our time. So before we conclude, is there anything that anyone would like to add in closing? Any final thoughts, any final comments that you would like to make? I would like to say thanks for having me. Um, diabetes is definitely nothing to mess with. Um, there's lots of things you want to live for and take care of yourself. You may feel like giving up, but just keep going. There's changes. I've seen tons of changes in my 36 years and they're getting better. And I'd like to join in with her in saying that we hope that this discussion um, is a beacon of hope for people out there with diabetes. I know we showed some complications that can occur but I hope people can realize that you don't have to have a single complication, uh, that prevention is the goal, um, and that uh, there's even an award out there um, from the Diabetes Association, the Jocelyn Award, 
for people with type one diabetes who have managed their diabetes for 50 years or longer. And so um, it includes a picture and it shows that people can manage their diabetes, they can be successful, they can be and do whatever they want to be. There are professional athletes, dancers, um, all kinds of people living with diabetes and also accomplishing their goals. So we hope that through this program people find hope and support and resources uh, to be able to live well with diabetes. Thank you. Anyone else like to add anything? Thank well, education is really the key. So thank you so much for having us and allowing us to share. Well, and, and on that note, thank you all for joining us, especially, uh, I mean, I, thank you all of you equally, but I think a little bit of a special thank you to Tracy and Melissa. It's, I think, to, to get out and share your personal story with people in an effort to help uh, educate other people and to, to share this information with them, uh, that, that to me is a special kind of, of bravery. So I really appreciate that. I appreciate all of your time Thank you, Kim, for helping us get the two of them together. And thank you, Laura, for your invaluable information on, you know, food and nutrition. We really appreciate all of you. So um, we want to thank everyone who joined us tonight. Uh, if you have any additional questions, uh, I think, Kim, they can reach out to, to you at the, the Diabetes Center at Cookville Regional. Yes. Um, and so we are going to be, uh, in the next day, we're going to be sharing some resources sending out an email to everyone who participated with some of those links that we talked about and some of that other information. So please keep an eye out for that. Um, and just as a reminder, you can watch the full documentary of Blood Sugar Rising on your PBS Passport. Uh, if you are not already a Passport member, you can go to our site, wcte.org membership and learn how to become a Passport member. It's only $5 a month. So it's very affordable if you wanted to be able to watch a lot of your favorite PBS shows, including important documentaries like this one. Uh, and then you can also watch it uh, just streaming on Dub Channel 22 on Monday the 23rd at 8 p.m. Uh, so I, I hope you'll take the time to watch the full documentary. It's very insightful and very impactful. So thank you again to everyone who joined us. We really appreciate all of you. We appreciate your time. Thank you to our panelists. Have a wonderful night. Thank you. Thank you.